Our first reading this morning comes from Genesis 9, verses 8 to 17, and can be found on page 10 of the Church Bible. Genesis 9, 8 to 17, page 10 in the Church Bible. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come, I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading today is on page 1219 of the Church Bibles. 1219. 1 Peter chapter 3 from verse 18 to the end of the chapter. Chapter 3 from verse 18. For Christ died for sins, once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, was saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. Today's Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Mark. That's page 1002, 1002 in the Church Bibles. Reading from the first chapter of Mark, verses 9 to 15. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Good morning, all. The readings we have had this morning... The three of them, they are very, very interesting to me. I think the greatest one is the, the old story of Noah, which we all had at one point or the other in Sunday schools. Sometimes we become too conversant with them and don't actually see the, read it and see the message in that story. 
So let us pray before we go into the word. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Lord, I pray that you speak through me. Speak into the hearts of your servants. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to try and go through the three scriptures, but I don't want to pick them one by one. I want to just bring the message that is in my heart from the three scriptures rolled together. And um, let me just kind of recap on the story of Noah. But before I do that, I just want to share something that I learned this week with you. At college, we are looking at, we are looking at attachments. And part of the things that we were discussing this week, and I kind of, I never buy it because I see it as more of psychology and science. The lecturer was saying that, you know, the image we have of God is built up from the image of who we see our earthly fathers. As she spoke on this, I was like looking at it and thinking, okay, the image I have of my father. How did I see my dad? If I'm going to kind of understand that and marry that to who I see God, I had to think and look back at my dad. He's been dead for a number of years. But then I remember, you know, my dad, when I was little, he was a chief, so he worked in the cuts, and he travels a lot. And when he comes back with all his nice clothes, we all run to him, not just his children. It's a big compound. You know, it's not like how we have our flats or houses here. We all live in very big compounds, so everybody run to my dad. He lovingly picks us up one after the other and we start singing because daddy has come home. Now, if I take that image, bring it to the image of God, I see the God of love. A God that accepts me the way I am when I come to him. A God that don't look at me and you know, see the filth in me when I've been playing in the mud, but will pick me up and love me nonetheless. The readings we have today of Noah, when we look at the story of Noah, Noah was quite old when he was called into ministry, well, to build the ark. We are told that he was 500 years old. That's in Genesis 5, verse 32. And then, if we assume that he was that old when he was called, and it took 100 years to build it, and by the time he finished this, he was 600 years old. The important thing for me in that, in that bit of it, recapping on it, is the fact that it doesn't matter how old you are. God can still use you the same way he will use a young person. Before Noah's, um, Noah was called to build the ark, things were going really bad. The people in those days became very horrible in the way they behaved. Where they had the rules and regulations that they had to follow, at that point, 
they decided to start living their lives. So they were not respecting God. They were not following the Sabbath day. They were not keeping it holy. Their body did not become holy to God anymore. They were doing whatever they see fit. Partying till all time of the night. Continuing in the morning. Drinking and getting silly. See, God got angry at the things he was seeing. The earth that he created, that he was proud of. When he finished creating the earth, he looked around and says, all things were beautiful. But this earth that he created, that he was so proud of, at this point was not beautiful anymore. So he looked to himself and decided something needs to be done. Something needs to give. So Noah was given the task to build the ark. We look at the story of Noah and I'm thinking, okay, this man, he was good. He followed what God had taught them to do. So, say the whole looting now is here, and you are singled out by God to do something for him. What a joy. What a privilege. But was it easy? Do you think it was easy for Noah? No. In those years that he was busy building the ark, when we were growing up, they told us that, you know, when Noah was building the ark, people that was going past, they were, you know, mocking him. Even some would go and do a poo and throw it at him. You know, they thought he was mad. There was no, you know, it's not like it was raining every day. And, the, you know, the man, they think he's insane because he's telling them that the flood is going to come. It's going to wash away everything. Come and build with me so that we can enjoy the, you know, enjoy the, dry, the dryness of this ark together. But they didn't believe him. They never believed him. If you look at what happened at that time with Noah to what is happening in our world now, when you go out to speak to somebody, do you think they'll believe you that, you know, the world is going to end? No. And most of us look at it and think, okay, the Bible is full of symbolism. Maybe that end time, Christ is coming, is just a symbol. Somebody sent me something this week, says, you know, I'd rather live my life believing that Christ is going to come than die, you know, than leave it as if he's not going to come, then die and find out that he is alive, that he is true. So how are we living our lives? How is our lives telling the story of who God is? See, during Noah's time, the rain came, like we read. Things were washed away. Everything. See, the flood did not just take just some people. Apart from the eight people that were saved. So it wasn't just, you know, one part of the world was washed away. Everything was washed away, as the Bible teaches us. We tend to pick things, you know, compartmentalize everything, pick the ones we want to believe from the Bible. Say, so, well, that was then, this is now. Is that how it is? Is it then and now? Is there a difference between the God that was served then and the God that is alive now? Now? 
Noah stayed in that boat, in the ark, <laughs> for a long time. Imagine living with animals and just your family. Some families, they can't actually stay together for that long. Remember, the ark was locked by God. So he didn't have the chance or the, you know, the freedom to just go and open it when they want and go. Everywhere was water, so they were forced to stay together as a family with all the animals. Apart from the animals that went in two by two, some were seven because they needed to eat. They needed to survive. And God provided for all this as they stayed together. They were forced to learn how to live together as a family, loving each other, loving the good, the bad, and the ugly of everything that was there. I don't like snakes very much, so I think about it, I'm thinking, how would I have lived in that ark with a snake? God would have made it possible. So whatever you think you don't like, through God, he will make it possible. When you walk through the tempest and the storm of your life, he is there to make things possible. You just have to believe that he will travel that journey with you. With him, nothing, and I mean nothing, is impossible. So, the rain came, Everything was washed away. Only eight people. Eight people out of everyone was saved. Now, I was reading, when I was reading and looking into this, if you read the story of Noah, I think most, of the, uh, most religions have their own different take on the story. And I used to think Noah's story was just for the Bible. Historically, is there as well that the flood was there. So it's not a made-up story. So if this story happened the way it was, only eight people were saved. And God was so mindful when he put things into the boat you know, he was mindful of what goes in because he did not want his w creation to be wiped out totally. Remember when he created, he loved what he created. He was proud of what he created. God is proud for his creation of you. He made you for a purpose. You are not just a mistake. There was a reason why you were created. God leads you to some places for a reason. Sometimes you are there to help somebody come out of a situation. Sometimes the person is there to help you to come out of a situation and be a better person. There is always a reason. Sometimes we get into situations or things happen in our lives and we say, why is me? Why me? I once asked my husband, we had an accident when we traveled um, some time ago, and um, we were almost killed. Um, the whole kid, all my kids and myself, my husband, we were in the vehicle that was kind of written off, really. And we came out, and he was like, oh, why me? And I looked at him. At that time, my husband wasn't a Christian. And I asked him, why not you? <laughs> and he looked at me thinking, this woman is mad. No. There is a lesson in every situation. For me at the time, it's for me to learn that when God is taking me on a journey, I'm not in control of it. He is in control of it. And it wasn't just a sightseeing. My life is not a sightseeing. God is in control of it. He puts me on this earth for a reason. I used to cry and think to myself, I said, well, everybody have a purpose. They were reading Purpose Driven Life in my old church 
in London, the vicar was so good and bought one for each and every member. And I read that book, finished, and I thought, well, <laughs> I can't see mine. Everybody have a purpose but me. People have what, you know, they, they are good at. But I don't have one. But that was the lie of the devil. Because I know I'm good at some things. I'm good at too many things, so to say. But it's just to know exactly the, 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 the cherry on the top that God has given to me. And slowly I'm getting there. It's a journey. Our life is a journey. See, Noah's that journey. Don't think he, he just made it just from that that uh, one year in the ship or in the in the ark. It was more than that. Noah started from the beginning. He was good. He was obedient to God from beginning. His righteousness is what gave him the job in the first place. And we don't mean his right, I don't mean his righteousness as if he was not, you know, he didn't do anything wrong in his life. Noah was saved by grace. He was saved by grace and he applied that grace in serving God. Being faithful to God and obeying what God had told him to do. When he was ordered to, you know, told to, to, to build the ark, he could have said, well, Lord, it's too big. I can't handle it. Send somebody else. But he did. It must have took him, you know, a long time to do it, but he did it. A few years ago, I was um, kind of given the job to rebuild my mom's house. At the time, I wasn't working full time, and I said, hmm, no can do. Every time the matter comes up, I'll cry to God. I'll tell God, well, if you're going to make me do this, you have to give me the money first, because I'm not going to start anything I can't finish. But by the time I come to realize that if he is sending me to do it, if I move, he will complete it. It's not my job to do that, but just to obey him. Noah obeyed, and God gave him what he needed to finish the ark. The obedience that he showed that helped get everything in place. When I said yes to building the house, believe me honestly, I can't tell you, you know, that I know how the money came all together, but the house was finished. Today we go home and people are so happy saying, you know, how good it is that we all build a house for our mom. She's got seven of us for me. I don't even want everybody to think that I'm the one that built it. So hey, it's fine by me. But she is happy. We've done what I've done what God said I should do. At the time, I gave an excuse. Oh, I have so much to do. I was running a homeless feeding project, and I was thinking I can't do that and do this. I will sit down and cry. And the Lord led me to a scripture that you know, what to those that are using the excuse of giving and stop looking after their parents. So I did as he commanded and everything fell in place. So I I look at the ark. If we look at the symbolism of the Noah's ark, one, we look at his faithfulness. 
one the second one is the salvation the symbol of salvation In the book of Matthew 24, 37 to 44, if I just read a little bit of that, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. I believe that we are in that place today. We are doing everything we want to do, living our lives. First Peter bit, we can see the symbol of the ark as that of faith and baptism. I think preparing this message, I have a lot on it and I picked too many things. I want to end by encouraging us in very little but I just want you to go away and think about it for yourself and I put it down like this I'll read it out because if I say I'm going to paraphrase it I'll lose some of the stuff that I've written down it says the heart of the matter is this Jesus is our ark of salvation today. Just as Noah was saved by grace through faith from the destruction of the flood, we can be saved by grace through faith in Jesus when we repent and accept him. Ephesians 2 verse 8 tells us that we have been saved. We have been saved. So grace is the reason we are here today. How are we showing our gratitude for that favor? It is a favor. We don't deserve it. We have done everything that God said don't do. That is what we decide to do. The Greek philosopher Cicero said, Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parents of them all. We read in the Bible of the ten lepers. Jesus saved all of them. Jesus has done something or the other for each and every one of us. How are we paying him back? One went back to say thank you. But ten were saved. After Noah finished with the ark, he only got eight saved, which is his family. At the end of it, they said the first thing he did when he came out was build an altar where he gave God thanks. We get new jobs today. Our first pay, we we'll go out and splash and drinks with friends. How about the person that gave you the job? How about coming to God first and say, Lord, thank you. And instead of going to call just your friends and go out and party, bring them to God's house and say, look, I want to go and say thank you to God for giving me a new job. I will end there <laughs> because I can continue and that's not good. People need to go home. <laughs> we all have a job. You see, the three readings that we did in each and every one of them, there was an element of preaching. Noah, in his life, preached before the boat in the way he lived and even after the boat before he went into the boat telling people to come out of their sins the apostle Peter preached the good news Jesus Christ in his life 
He gave his life for us. And it's that life that led to the covenants that we have today with him. He is the bridge between us and the Father. So my question to you today, which I will leave with you to answer for yourself, in what way are you using your life as a testimony to God? We are all evangelists. Noah was one. The apostles were one. God has given you something to share with somebody. Please share it. Amen.